My uh, kids and my wife will know well that I have a place in my home that is my spot. It's the place that I go when I just want to have a place to chill out, right? You get home from a long day at work, you get home from, you know, whatever's going on in the day, and you just kind of want to relax for a second. Probably, like me, you have a place like that in your home where you just chill out. For me, it's the couch in the, in the living room. I've got a particular place that I take one of the pillows and I put the pillow on the armrest and stretch out on that couch and cross my arms right here and you can just lay back and there's just this feeling of, ah, that comes over you. You probably got a spot like that too, right? It's whether it's a chair or a bed or a couch or some, you know, lazy boy recliner. That was what my dad had back in the day. Still does, in fact. You've got a spot. Well, my spot over the last few weeks has been violated, and I'm not terribly happy about it. You see, we've gotten this new puppy. Um, I think I've told you about Little Riggins before. He's named after a character in Friday Night Lights, for those of you who know that show. Anyway, Riggins has decided he's gotten old enough now that he's able to jump up on the furniture, uh, which is a habit that's going to come to an end here pretty soon. But he's gotten into this habit of jumping up on the furniture, and any time little Riggins sees me making a move for my place on that couch, he rushes up and tries to get there before me. And so he'll jump up on, you know, where, basically where my head is supposed to rest on the, on the armrest, and he'll snuggle into my little corner. Now, I've figured out over the weeks that I really don't think Riggins is trying to, like, take my spot on the couch. I think what he's doing instead is deciding that he's just going to take, take some time to get there quick so that he can snuggle with me, which is very sweet, even if it's annoying. And the reason I think that is because I can just sort of like lay down sort of on Riggins sort of as he's snuggling in my spot. And he'll, he'll sort of squirm around and get in a different position and just kind of lay his head down on my shoulder. He's, he's, just, he's just snuggling with me. Well, last night, uh, as we were going through this whole rigmarole, Riggins saw my daughter, Juliet, whom he loves way better than anyone else in the family. And anytime he sees her, he makes a beeline to try to get to her. Riggins decided to jump up from his spot right here, kind of on my chest, and make a run for Juliet, who was walking through the room. And he decided to use my face as the step stool for getting down off the couch. So some of you may have noticed that I have these two claw marks right here on the side of my face. That's not like me trying to shave my eyebrows or something. That is, that is uh, the dog attacking me. But what I've learned from this is that some of the rest and some of the just ah that I feel from being on that couch and having being in my place has sort of been interrupted. And I'm realizing just how important that sense of comfort and rest is in your home. I mean, you probably know what that's like when you, when you get into that place and you feel just the exhale and you just think, ah, oh, now I can rest. It's a good feeling, isn't it? It's an important feeling. It's something that we need. And it's something, actually, that we're going to talk about today as we look at 1 Kings chapter 8. Take a Bible if you have one. Turn over to 1 Kings chapter 8. Uh, that's what we're going to be looking at. And we're going to be looking at, at really a long sigh of Ah, as the nation of Israel finally finds its home and a permanent place to dwell. We've been looking at this, uh, uh, this book of 1 Kings for the last few weeks, and so we're going to continue that series today. The book, if you've not been with us over the last few, few weeks, I'll give you a quick running start. It was written about 2,500 years ago. It tells the story of the monarchy in the ancient nation of Israel. It starts in 1 Kings chapter 1 with the death of the great King David, who's like the you know, paradigmatic king of the, the whole nation. If you talk about kings in Israel, David was the thing, right? He was, he was the great king of the nation. That's where the book of 1 Kings starts, is with his death. And it runs, if you take 2 Kings along with it, it runs for almost 400 years until finally the dynasty of the great King David is pretty much in ruins, and the last Davidic king you think, is being carried off into exile in Babylon. Well, for the last couple of weeks, as we've been looking at uh, these first few chapters of 1 Kings, the focus of that whole story has been not on David, because he's dead and out of the picture, but it's been focused on David's son, Solomon, who came to the throne after David died, or just slightly before David died, actually, and Solomon's desire to finally build a temple for God. In other words, a, a great ornate building in which God could dwell permanently. 
instead of just in this kind of temporary tent that God had been dwelling in while the people of Israel were wandering around in the wilderness and in their own land. Well, Solomon's building of the temple, which we, we looked at last week in all of its glory and all of its detail, is a huge moment in the history of Israel. It's not just the building of a building. It's not just the, 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 a national symbol. It's a huge moment because it marks the end of one era and the beginning of another for the whole nation of Israel. See, for like 480 years, from the time that God had rescued the people out of slavery in Egypt, all the way up to the time of the building in the temple, of the temple, the Israelites were basically this homeless, nomadic people. They just, they didn't have a home. They didn't have a place to, to lay their head. I mean, even the Ark of the Covenant, the symbolic throne of God, which, you know, symbolized this is the place where God sits enthroned over his people, had its only home in this very temporary tent that they called the tabernacle. Now, that's a big word, right, tabernacle, and it makes you think of, of something huge and ornate and beautiful and all the rest. It, it wasn't. I mean, it was a tent, basically. It had tent poles, and it had canvas, and you know, there was some beauty in it. But basically, it was meant to be put up and taken down on a moment's notice as the people of Israel had to wander about. That was the home of God, a tent. So when Solomon finally builds the temple, this, this building with gold and cedar and beauty and artwork and all the rest, when Solomon finally builds this thing and the Ark of the Covenant is brought from its temporary home, it was in the, the, a fortress sort of in the city of Jerusalem dwelling in this tent, when it was brought from that temporary home into this very solid home made out of, made out of wood and gold and brick and stone, the message is just huge. We, the nation of Israel, and He, our God, are here, and we're here to stay. This is finally home. And so, 1 Kings chapter 8 is this great sigh of relaxation. Oh, we're here. That's what's going on. More, though, 1 Kings chapter 8 is also a huge moment for the people realizing yet again that God keeps his promises. Because, because when Solomon dedicates the temple and sort of opens it for the Ark of the Covenant to, to come into it, it's the culmination of all these promises that God had been making really since Abraham. And God had told Abraham way back in Genesis that he was going to give him a land to live in. He told the nation of Israel through Moses in Exodus, I'm going to give you a land to, to, to be your own. And then to David himself, listen to what he had said to David in 2 Samuel chapter 7. He says, I will, this is God speaking, I will appoint a place for my people Israel and I'll plant them so that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them no more as formerly from the time I appointed judges over my people Israel. And I, he says, will give you rest from all your enemies. So the building of the temple is, is huge. Because it's a moment when the people of God are told by their king, look back at everything God promised to you and look down at your feet now because he's fulfilled all of those promises. Well, today we're going to look at a relatively short section of the book of 1 Kings, at, at, at least as compared to these huge sections that we've been looking at over the last couple of weeks, right? So in, in the last two weeks, we've looked at one section that was four chapters long, another section was like three and a half chapters long, maybe a little more than that even, and, and now we're going to look at just kind of one chapter, 54 verses of chapter 8, where Solomon dedicates this temple that he's built. Most of what we're going to be looking at today is just Solomon talking. He first makes this address to the people. He turns, turns toward the people and makes this address to them about some of the meaning of the temple. Then he turns his back on the people toward the temple and he, he prays a long prayer to God. It's just, it's just him talking. And then he turns back around to the people and, and gives them a benediction at the end of it. Now, because there's not a whole lot of story in this, because there's not a whole lot of you know, movement, and there, we, got, we don't have any battles here, we don't have anybody, you know, being assassinated like we did in the, in the earlier chapters of it. There's not a ton of action, and so I know that looking at a whole chapter, 54 verses of just Solomon talking, might sound a little bit boring. But let me encourage you to pay attention anyway, even if you think it's going to be boring. Because remember, by this point in the story, Solomon is literally the wisest person who has ever lived in the history of the world, except for Jesus. I mean, you know, that's, that's kind of what happened when, when God said, what do, you, what do you want from me? I'll give you anything that you want. Not silver, not gold, not palaces, not power. He said, I want you to make me wise. And God says, yep, okay, I will make you the wisest person in the world. So if that's true, and Solomon really is that, then it probably is a good idea for us to listen pretty much to anything Solomon says at this point in the story. 
He knows God, and he knows his people, and so we have here a lot to learn from what he says. So we're, gonna, we're actually going to read, uh, not all, but most of chapter 8 here. Uh, I know it's a long text, but it's wonderful, so we're going to read it. Just remember the situation as we read it. Solomon's been working for seven years to build this, this temple. In the first part of chapter 8, once the temple is completed, the Ark of the Covenant is brought up to the Temple Mount. It's been in this tent. Now it's put in place, and God's presence in the form of this cloud fills the temple and As that happens, as the cloud fills the temple and the glory of the Lord shines out from the temple, Solomon starts to speak. So look with me at 1 Kings chapter 8. We're going to start reading in verse 12. Then Solomon said, The Lord has said that he would dwell in thick darkness. And I have indeed built you an exalted house, a place for you to dwell in forever. Then the king turned around and blessed all the assembly of Israel, while all the assembly of Israel stood. And he said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. Who with his hand has fulfilled what he promised with his mouth to David my father, saying, Since the day that I brought my people Israel out of Egypt, I chose no city out of all the tribes of Israel in which to build a house, that my name might be there. But I chose David to be over my people Israel. Now it wasn't the heart of David my father to build a house for the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. But the Lord said to David my father, Whereas it was in your heart to build a house for my name, you did well that it was in your heart. Nevertheless, you shall not build the house, but your son, who shall be born to you, shall build the house for my name. Now the Lord has fulfilled his promise that he had made. For I have risen in the place of David my father, and I sit on the throne of Israel, just as the Lord promised. And I have built the house for the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. And there I have provided a place for the ark, in which is the covenant of the Lord that he made with our fathers when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. Then Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the assembly of Israel, and spread out his hands toward heaven, and said, O Lord, God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth beneath, keeping covenant and showing steadfast love to your servants who walk before you with all their heart. You have kept with your servant David, my father, what you declared to him. You spoke with your mouth and with your hand have fulfilled it this day. Now therefore, O Lord, God of Israel, keep for your servant David, my father, what you have promised him, saying, You shall not lack a man to sit before me, On the throne of Israel, if only your sons pay close attention to their way, to walk before me as you have walked before me. And now therefore, O God of Israel, let your word be confirmed, which you have spoken to your servant David, my father. But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you. How much less this house that I have built. Yet have regard to the prayer of your servant and to this plea, O Lord my God, listening to the cry and to the prayer that your servant prays before you this day, That your eyes might be open night and day toward this house, the place of which you have said, My name shall be there. That you may listen to the prayer that your servant offers toward this place. And listen to the plea of your servant and of your people Israel when when they pray toward this place. And listen in heaven your dwelling place. And when you hear, forgive. If a man sins against his neighbor and is made to take an oath and comes and swears his oath before your altar in this house, then hear in heaven and act and judge your servants. Condemning the guilty by bringing his conduct on his own head. And vindicating the righteous by rewarding him according to his righteousness. When your people Israel are defeated before the enemy because they've sinned against you. And if they turn again to you and acknowledge your name and pray and plead with you in this house. Then hear in heaven and forgive the sin of your people Israel. And bring them again to the land that you gave to their fathers. When heaven is shut up. And there is no rain because they have sinned against you. If they pray toward this place and acknowledge your name and turn from their sin. When you afflict them, then hear in heaven and forgive the sin of your servants, your people Israel. When you teach them the good way in which they should walk and grant rain upon your land, which you have given to your people as an inheritance. If there's famine in the land, if there's pestilence or blight or mildew or locust or caterpillar, if their enemy besieges them in the land at their gates, whatever plague, whatever sickness there is, whatever prayer, whatever plea is made by any man or by all your people Israel, each knowing the affliction of his own heart and stretching out his hands toward this house, then hear in heaven your dwelling place and forgive and act and render to each whose heart you know according to all his way. For you, you only know the hearts of all the children of mankind that they may fear you all the days that they live in the land that you gave to our fathers. Likewise, when a foreigner who is not of your people Israel comes from a far country for your name's sake, for they shall hear of your great name and your mighty hand and your outstretched arm. When he comes and prays toward this house, hear in heaven your dwelling place and do according to all for which the foreigner calls to you 
in order that all the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you, as do your people Israel, and that they may know that this house that I have built is called by your name. If your people go out to battle against their enemy, by whatever way you shall send them, and they pray to the Lord toward the city that you've chosen and the house that I've built for your name, then hear in heaven their prayer and their plea and maintain their cause. If they sin against you, for there's no one who doesn't sin, and you are angry with them and give them to an enemy so that they are carried away captive to the land of the enemy, far off or near, yet if they turn their heart in the land to which they have been carried captive and repent and plead with you in the land of their captors, saying, we have sinned and have acted perversely and wickedly, if they repent with all their heart and with all their soul in the land of their enemies who carried them captive and pray to you toward their land which you have given to their fathers, the city that you have chosen and the house that I have built for your name, Then hear in heaven your dwelling place, their prayer and their plea, and maintain their cause and forgive your people who have sinned against you and all their transgressions that they have committed against you and grant them compassion in the sight of those who have carried them captive, that they may have compassion on them. For they are your people and your heritage which you brought out of Egypt from the midst of the iron furnace. Let your eyes be open to the plea of your servant and to the plea of your people Israel, giving ear to them whenever they call to you. For you separated them from among all the peoples of the earth to be your heritage, as you declared through Moses your servant when you brought our fathers out of Egypt, O Lord God. Now as Solomon finished offering all this prayer and plea to the Lord, he arose from before the altar of the Lord, where he had knelt with hands outstretched toward heaven. And he stood and blessed all the assembly of Israel with a loud voice, saying, Blessed be the Lord who has given rest to his people Israel according to all that he had promised. Not one word has failed of all his good promise, which he spoke by Moses, his servant. The Lord our God be with us, as he was with our fathers. May he not leave us or forsake us, that he may incline our hearts to him, to walk in all his ways and to keep his commandments, his statutes, and his rules, which he commanded our fathers. Let these words of mine, with which I have pleaded before the Lord, be near to the Lord our God day and night. And may he maintain the cause of his servant and the cause of his people Israel, as each day requires that all the peoples of the earth may know that the Lord is God. There is no other. Let your heart, therefore, be wholly true to the Lord our God, walking in his statutes and keeping his commandments as at this day. We'll stop there. The rest of the chapter is, is just recounting the many thousands of sacrifices that Solomon made on that day and the feast that he declared throughout the land because it was such a big day. But as we read this prayer, you can, you can tell that it's an extraordinary thing, isn't it? Because over and over again, it pulls in so many different themes from the story of the Old Testament so far. I mean, you've got, you've got the Exodus, you've got the Mosaic Covenant, you've got the Davidic Covenant, you've got the Abrahamic Covenant. You even have all the blessings and curses that God promises to his people from Deuteronomy, according to whether they keep the covenant or they break it. I mean, it's all there. And what Solomon does is that he takes all of that and weaves it all together really in this wonderfully, I think, pastoral way of recognizing that the people are going to sin and yet that God always stands ready to forgive. The main idea of all of this is is this. Our relationship and friendship with God is secured not by anything we do, but by God's unfailing faithfulness. Our relationship and friendship with God is secured not by anything we do, but by His unfailing faithfulness. Two points to the sermon here, uh, breaking up the the text into kind of two two parts. It doesn't follow exactly with the subheadings in your Bible, but I'll explain that in just a minute. But but two, two points. Number one, our flakiness and God's solidity. Our flakiness and God's solidity, that's verses 12 through 30. And then number two, our sinfulness and God's faithfulness. Our sinfulness and God's faithfulness. That's verse 31 all the way to really the the end of the prayer. So point number one, our flakiness, God's solidity, and then our sinfulness and God's faithfulness. Let's start to look at what Solomon has to say to us here. Number one, our flakiness and God's solidity. As you look at the the sort of subheadings in in chapter 8, you might find it odd that I'm breaking the text up at verse 30. Um, But what we're doing 
is looking not just at the structure of the prayer and the address in terms of who Solomon is talking to. Because if you do that, you, you get a kind of surface breakup of, you know, the first section of it is Solomon talking to the people. Second section is Solomon talking to the, to the Lord. Third section is Solomon talking back to the people. But it's a little bit artificial to break it up in that way because actually, regardless of who Solomon is talking to, it's one theological whole that runs from the very beginning all the way to the end. And if you look at it, if you look at the beginning and the middle and the end, you can see that progression. It starts with Solomon recognizing all the promises that God made to Abraham, to Moses, then to David especially. Then in the middle portion, which is the largest portion of all, you, you've got the first fulfillment of all of those promises in the establishment of the temple. That's what Solomon spends most of the time talking about. And then it ends with an even greater fulfillment of those promises in verse 60 when all the nations of the world are called to stream into Jerusalem and worship Yahweh. So that's the theological structure of, of the prayer. And that's why I'm kind of breaking it at verse 30, between 30 and 31. So let me, let me show you these, these divisions. Let's just look at the second part first, verse 31. I want to just show you why... I'm breaking it at verse 30. Look at verse 31. Starting in 31 and running all the way through verse 53, you've got the main body of the prayer. And as you probably noticed as we were reading it, it's made up of seven different petitions or asks that Solomon makes of the Lord. We're going to talk about those later, categorize them, look at some of their details, all the rest. I'm not talking about that now. Before that, though, in the section that we're talking about first, 12, verse 12, all the way down through verse 30, before he gets to the petitions, Solomon makes a kind of theological introduction to the whole thing. He wants a couple of things clear theologically before he starts asking God for things. And in that introduction, he basically says two things. First of all, from 12 through 26... He focuses exclusively on the fact that the building of this temple, the reason the temple is there in the first place, is simply and wholly because of God's faithfulness to keep his promises. God had made promises to people in the past, including to King David, and now Solomon wants you to see in 12 through 26, this thing is here because God has kept his promises. We'll talk about that in a second. Second thing he wants to make clear, though, in 27 to 30 is that he recognizes that even though he's built a house for God to dwell in, and even though the presence of God has, has filled the temple and there's, there's light and a cloud and all the rest in the temple, he is under absolutely no illusion that God is contained in that building. And he wants you to know that as well. He wants you to know that the God of the universe will never be contained in a single building. There's no way that that could be. And the thing is, if you take both of those things together, that this whole thing is based on God's keeping of his promises and no building that we could ever build could ever contain him, you sort of get the point of what Solomon is saying here. You get the point that God is not constrained by human activity. So let's first look at what Solomon says about covenant in 12 through 26. These the fact that the temple exists now, it's built, it's completed because God has kept his promises. Let's look at what Solomon says about that in verses 12 through 26. If you look at verses 12 through 13, Solomon said, The Lord has said that he would dwell in thick darkness, and I've indeed built you an exalted house, a place for you to dwell in forever. Verses 12 and 13 really kind of belong more properly with what's gone before in the first few verses of chapter 8. So the cloud fills the temple, right? That's what it says in the very last few verses of uh, of that first section of chapter 8, the cloud fills the, the temple. And so Solomon is, in verses 12 to 13, just kind of marveling at that. You know, it's almost like God says in his word that he dwells in thick darkness. And look, here's a, here's a thick, dark cloud that has descended into the temple. And so God is, is here, right? You see the logic? If God dwells in thick darkness, we've got thick darkness in the temple. This thing worked, right? God has taken up residence in the temple. He's just kind of marveling at that. But then in 14, he turns to address the people themselves, and, and, and basically what he tells them is, listen, guys, you need to understand that the reason this thing exists is not just because I have built it, not just because I got, you know, Hiram of, of Tyre to cut down a bunch of cedar trees and bring them here, not just because we hammered out a bunch of gold. The reason it's here is because God has kept the promises he made to you years ago. So look at 14. 
Then the king turned around and blessed all the assembly of Israel, while all the assembly of Israel stood. And he said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. And, and then here's the kicker. Who with his hand has fulfilled what he promised with his mouth to David, my father. And then he talks about what that is. From 16 to 19, he just kind of recounts the promise that God made to David back in 2 Samuel 7. And in 20, he brings it all down to the point again. Look at verse 20. Now the Lord has fulfilled his promise that he made. For I have risen in the place of David, my father, and I sit on the throne of Israel as the Lord promised. And I have built the house for the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. Again, just as he promised. Now here's, here's what's interesting about, about this. If you go back to 2 Samuel 7 and look at the covenant that God made with David. He, God essentially makes four promises to David in, in 2 Samuel 7. You can go look at it later. You can count them up. You can see what's happening. He promises him that he's going to bring the nation of Israel to a place where they can have rest. So a land, a land of their own, that's one. He promises him that his son is going to sit on the throne of Israel. That's number two. He promises him that that son is going to be the one to build the temple. That's number three. And then he promises him an everlasting dynasty. You will always have someone, David, to sit on your throne. The throne will never lack a man to sit on it as king of Israel. Well, see, what Solomon is doing here in the first part of this address to the people, is that he's saying, look, three of those promises have just been fulfilled. Three of them. There's only one left that hasn't been fulfilled yet. He's going to get to that one later. Three of them have been fulfilled. You see, you see where they are? God promised a place. We've got a place. God promised that David's son was going to sit on the throne. I'm David's son. I'm on the throne. Promise fulfilled. He also promised that David's son was going to build the temple. Lo and behold, temple built. He's saying you need to see what God has promised and you need to recognize that God has kept those promises. And then if you look at 21, there I have provided a place for the ark in which is the covenant of the Lord that he made with our fathers when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. He even recognizes that the fulfillment of those promises isn't just a fulfillment of promises to David. It's a fulfillment of promises that goes all the way back to the Exodus, all the way back to Abraham. All the way back to the underlying covenant that God made with his people. You see, that, you see the point that Solomon is trying to get through the people's really thick skulls. He is trying to make sure that in their minds all the glory in this moment goes to God. It is very different from the way our politicians operate today. Our politicians would stand up in front of the temple and start knocking off all the things that they did to make this happen. And then they would end it with a plea to you to vote for them so they could bring more glory to themselves and continue to do things. That is not what Solomon does. Solomon, the king of Israel, stands in front of the temple and essentially says, This is not here because I have done it. This is here because God has done it. The fact that I'm standing here, it's not my doing. It's God's doing. It's the result of his deciding for his own purposes, ultimately, to bring his temple to bear. And that is dependent on his deciding for his own purposes, even to choose the nation of Israel out of the world. It's all God. And Solomon recognizes that in these words. He pushes it even further in, in the next few verses, 22 to 26. I mean, if you look at, if you just kind of let your eyes roll over verses 22 to 26 there, you can see that the focus is still on God's fulfilling the promises he made in his covenant with David. Here, though, he's already in those first few verses said three of those promises have been fulfilled. Here in, tw in uh, 22 to 26, he focuses on that fourth one, right? He focuses on that fourth promise that hasn't yet been fulfilled, the eternal dynasty, and he basically asks God to fulfill that promise. Then you notice as you read 22 to 26 that he's confident that, that that's going to happen. You know, Lord, carry out, your, carry out your promises. You can look at verse 26 and see his confidence. Now therefore, O God of Israel, let your word be confirmed which you have spoken to your servant David, my father. Why is he so confident? Why is he so confident that God is going to fulfill that fourth promise? Well, it's because God is batting a thousand after three bats, and there's no reason to think he's not going to knock a home run in his fourth at bat either. Solomon's confidence that God is going to keep his promise is based on his recognition that God has always kept his promises. Do you have a tendency to doubt what God has promised? 
to use a Christian, to use a person. Do you, you have any tendencies to do that? I know many Christians do. We look at the promises in the New Testament. We look at, at, at God's promises to forgive, God's promises to save, God's promises to care for us. And there's this nagging doubt in the back of our minds that maybe there's some fine print underneath it. Maybe there's some way that God is going to be able to wiggle out of keeping that promise. Friend, if those kinds of doubts live in your mind, do what Solomon does here. Go back and look at other promises God made. Look at all the things that threatened those promises. And then look at the fact that God kept the promises anyway. I promise you it will establish your heart. And you'll be able to breathe deep and breathe, breathe a sigh of relief and realize God will keep his promises. I mean, think about everything that happened. Between the time that God made the promise to Abraham and now this fulfillment of it here. Everything that happened between the time that that he made the promise to, to Moses and to David and the fulfillment of it here. There were so many times that God could have just said, no, that's it. Nope, pulling the plug on that. That was a conditional promise. It had some fine print to it. You have violated the fine print. You've broken the contract. It's over. He could have done that a hundred times through the story of the Pentateuch, but he doesn't. He doesn't. He keeps his promises despite the threats. I want you to see a couple of other things too. Look at verses 22 to 23. This is a related point here. Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the assembly of Israel, spread out his hands toward heaven and said, O Lord, God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth beneath. There's no God like you. Why? Why is there no God like you? What makes God unique? Because you keep covenant and show steadfast love to your servants who walk before you with all their heart. Now, I don't know about you, but when I'm, when I'm reading that, if I'm kind of paying attention, and Solomon is saying all this stuff about how God is incomparable among all the gods of the universe, I'm not expecting what he says there. I'm expecting him to say something like, oh God, you are incomparable. There is no one like you among all the gods of the universe because you created the cosmos or something, Right? Because you split the Red Sea, because you destroyed the armies. I'm, I'm expecting something like that. What I'm not expecting is there is no God like you. And the reason you're so unique is because you keep your promises. And yet that's what he says. And if you think about it, you realize that that really is what sets the God of the Bible apart from any other God we or the ancient Israelites might chase after. And that would have been a point that to the Israelites was just near and dear to their hearts. He keeps his promises unlike all the other false gods of the nations. I mean, you know the false gods of the nations had just, they were were just notorious for not keeping the promises that they made. Which is because they didn't exist, so they didn't have any control over those those promises. They were just made up, but they were notorious for not keeping their promises. Then you might have some fertility god that would say, hey, if you'll just come sacrifice to me, if you'll just, you know, do the things that you do in front of a fertility god, you know, the priests say, I promise that I will bring fertility to the whole land. I'll make your crops grow. And they go do the thing one year, and lo and behold, there's, there's crops, right? They go do the thing the next year, and lo and behold, there's famine. And the next year, there's crops, and then the next year, there's famine. And they're all left just scratching their heads going, wait, what? what, what? This god doesn't keep his promises, it's just as random as if you were throwing some dice. And there's, an, there's an ancient poem, actually, that's pretty funny in this regard. It's called the Epic of Gilgamesh. Uh, it was written many, many years before this time. But basically, it's a poem that tells the story about this great warrior named Gilgamesh who defeats uh, the great villain of the cosmos. His name is Humbaba, believe it or not. Humbaba. And when he's destroyed Humbaba, uh, Gilgamesh decks himself out in all of these like royal clothes and gold and white silk and all, all the rest of it. I mean, he, he, he's supposed to look very royal. And he catches the attention of the goddess Ishtar, who, all decked out in his robes, she thinks he's very handsome. And she comes to him, this goddess, and she offers to marry Gilgamesh. And then in the funniest part of the whole poem, Gilgamesh basically turns to her, this goddess, and says, Are you kidding me? I know you. And then in the most scathing of terms, he just lays out all the ways that she has been faithless to other people. You messed up on this one. You lied to this one. You pulled a trick on this one. There is no way in the world that you are becoming Mrs. Gilgamesh. Not a chance. (laughs) She was famous for a litany of broken promises. And so were the other gods around her. I mean, you can can go go to Dagon, right? 
You can go to the god, the god Dagon of the Philistines, and you can, you can bow down to him, and you can worship him. And then the next day, you go in thinking that Dagon is going to be able to do something for you. And, and where is Dagon? He's on his face with his head and his hands broken off. He can't think for you. He can't see. He can't speak. And he doesn't have any hands to do anything either. He's utterly unreliable. You can go to Mount Carmel with Elijah, and you can watch the, the prophets of Baal dancing and chanting and going crazy, and you can cut, you can cut their arms until they, they bleed and dance around the altar. And what happens? Nothing happens. He doesn't come. He doesn't burn up the sacrifice uh, to the point that Elijah makes fun of him and says, hey, guys, maybe he's occupied in the bathroom, and he can't hear you. He's utterly unreliable. He doesn't do anything. Now, I doubt anybody here is tempted to go worship Dagon or cut yourself in the name of Baal. I doubt anybody here is, you know, going to deck out and try to win the heart of the goddess Ishtar either. But we have our own gods, don't we? We got our own gods. We have, we have pleasure. We have rest. We have money. We have influence. We have affluence. We have leisure. And all of those things around us are constantly, constantly making promises to us. I will give you rest. I will give you peace. I will give you power. I'll give you pleasure. And I promise, if you bow down and worship those gods, you will find them utterly unreliable. But not God. Not God. When he promises, he acts. When he promises, he keeps his promises. When he says that I will save you from your sins if you believe in Jesus Christ, he means it and he will save those who believe in Jesus Christ. When he says all those who trust in him will not perish but have everlasting life, he means it and all those who believe in him will not perish but have everlasting life. When he says I will not lose one of them who have trusted in me but raise them all all up 100% in the last day, you better believe that 100% of those who have trusted in Jesus will be there on the last day raised up. He always keeps his promises. Here's, a, here's another thing that I want you to, I want you to notice here. And, and here we're getting kind of down into the, the deep truth of what Solomon's talking about. Look at verse 25. Look at verse 25. Now therefore, O Lord God of Israel... Keep for your servant David, my father, what you have promised him, saying, You shall not lack a man to sit before me on the throne of Israel if only your sons pay close attention to their way to walk before me as you have walked before me. O oh God, keep your promise to my father David that he'll never lack a man to sit on the throne if we are really good people. Now, that's kind of terrifying, isn't it? It is really, really bothersome to see that in the text because it seems to make the promise of God to David contingent on human obedience. If we, your sons, O David, if, if we, your descendants, do this, then you'll always have someone to sit on the throne. And, and here's the problem in the, in the narrative. Here's the, the tension in the narrative. We already know from reading the first seven and a half chapters that Solomon has shown himself not to be a great candidate to make this promise depend on. You know, for all of our fairy tales and for all of our Sunday school lessons, Solomon does not turn out to be a great guy in the first seven and a half chapters of Kings. He's certainly a mixed character. He went off and got a foreign wife from Egypt, right? He's got 40,000 horses. He's even given double or even quadruple the attention to his own palace that he does to the house of God. So he's not a great candidate to be saying, you know, if we are all righteous, then you will establish the throne. Huge tension there. So, so what's going on? What, what, what's the solution? I mean, is this project of the kingship of David, the dynasty of David, is it just doomed from the start because of this, because of this if? Well, kind of, and kind of not. I mean, you read the rest of the story of the, the Bible, and you'll see that, yeah, in the short term, it was, in fact, doomed. I mean, Solomon is not wrong here when he puts that if statement in. He's not wrong. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, God tells David that when his sons sin against the Lord, the Lord is going to discipline them. 
It will not go well for them. He tells David that right up front. There's a part of this covenant that is conditional. If your sons do what is right, it will go well for them. If they do not do what is right, I will discipline them. And what you find out is that that's exactly what happens through the next 400 years and 40 kings. The kings sin. They are idolatrous. Some of them even offer their, offer their children in child sacrifice to, to Molech and other gods. And what happens in response? The nation is punished. And finally, 400 years down the line, the dynasty itself is in ruins. And the reason is because of this conditional portion of the covenant. If you walk in my ways, it'll go well for you. And if not, it won't. They didn't walk in the ways of the Lord. And so by the end of it, there's nobody sitting on the throne of David. Jehoiachin is carried off to die in exile in Babylon. Zedekiah has his eyes put out after his sons, his heirs, are killed. And he's carried off to die in Babylon. It's over. But what's interesting here is that Solomon, even in the midst of all this, seems to realize that even though there's that sort of surface level conditional aspect to the covenant, he seems to understand that there's also an even deeper foundation to it that is not dependent in the least on human behavior. I mean, look, look at 26 again. Now, therefore, O God of Israel, let your word be confirmed, which you have spoken to your servant David, my father. It's, it's celebratory, right? It's, it's confident. Which would be entirely weird if Solomon thought that the whole promise to David was conditional on his behavior. I mean, can you imagine even praying a prayer like that? You know, so celebratory and, and confident. Lord, keep your, keep your promise to my father David that's based entirely on my behavior. I am confident that you'll keep that promise even though it's dependent on me. I can't even imagine praying a prayer like that. But what Solomon knows is that ultimately it's not dependent on him. He knows that God had said to David, your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. So yeah, there's a sense in which a piece of that covenant, how well it was going to go for those kings, even ultimately the fact that whether they you know, go into exile or not was dependent on the behavior of the kings in the nation. But there's another sense in which God was saying, none of that matters, it's like rain on granite. It's like rain on granite because the foundation of this, the fact that I'm going to set a king on the throne in the end who will reign forever has nothing to do with you. You can't mess that up. You can't break that. I'm going to do it. And then the beautiful thing, when you realize that God does that in Jesus, he finally places a king on the throne who's going to reign forever, is that all of the broken junk at the top of it, the conditional stuff, Jesus even pulls it together and makes it right. Because finally there's a king on the throne who does perfectly walk in God's ways forever and ever. It's all dependent on him. And friends, here's, here's the beauty of this whole thing. The beauty of this whole thing is that in exactly the same way, your salvation, the new covenant that, that, that organizes your relationship with God, is not, praise God, dependent on your behavior to nail it down. We get that wrong so often, but it's not, it's not dependent on your behavior. That covenant, your relationship between you and God, is determined 100%. It's guaranteed 100% by God's determination to save you and by the rock-solid righteousness of Jesus Christ. At the end of this service, I, we're, we're going to sing this song, Before the Throne of God Above, and it, just, it makes this point so clearly. In fact, take out your bulletin. Let's look at it for a second. Just turn over to, toward the back. You'll have to flip back two or three pages past the, the blank notes pages. But look, look what this song says so beautifully. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea. That, that, that's a judicial word. What it means is when you stand before the judge of the, of the entire universe, you're going to have to make some plea to him. You're going to have to say, God, on, on account of, of this particular thing, Declare me to be righteous and let me into your presence. That's your plea. And he's saying, the, the, the author of this, she, it's, uh, yeah, Charity Lee's Bancroft. She's saying, before the throne of God above, I have a strong plea. I have a strong reason to give to God to save me. I have a perfect reason to give to God. And that is a great high priest whose name is love, who ever lives and pleads 
from me. My name is graven on his hands. My name is written on his heart. And I know that while in heaven he stands, no tongue can ever bid me thence depart. Nobody can tell me to leave as long as Jesus Christ is standing there. Look at, look at the second one. When Satan tempts me to despair, when I have these doubts that come into our minds and hearts, when he tells me of the guilt within, where do I look? Do I look inward again to try to find something that doesn't make me feel guilty? No, I look upward and I see him there who made an end to all my sin. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God, the great judge of all the world, is satisfied. He's happy not to look at me and condemn me, but to look on him and pardon me. Because his righteousness is imputed to me. Look at the last verse. Behold him there, the risen lamb, my perfect spotless righteousness. He is the great unchangeable I am, the king of glory and of grace. One with him, I can't die. My soul is purchased by his blood. My life is hid with him on high with Christ, my Savior, and my God. You have a strong and perfect plea before the Father on the last day. And you know what that plea is? It's not going to be to start pulling stuff out of your pocket. Lord, look at my, look at my church attendance. Look at my Sunday school attendance. Here's my 50-year Sunday school pen. And, and here's, you know, here's my spotless thought life. Lord, look at all of this and declare me righteous. No, it's going to be to point to Jesus and say, on account of him, save me. That's your plea before the Father. And it is a strong and perfect plea. Amen. Same kind of point by the way, is made in verses 27 to 30, where where Solomon makes this crucial theological point that God isn't actually going to live or be contained in this building that he's built. I mean, it's it's really a remarkable point that he makes. We read it a little while ago, but you see what he's saying? He's saying, yeah, of course, this temple's going to be a focal point of God's presence because God has chosen for it to be a focal point. But even if this temple is raised to the ground, even if the cedar that, that, that makes up its walls underneath the gold is, is, is charred into, into nothing but ash, God himself isn't affected by that in the least. And that was a critical lesson that Israel was going to have to learn because that's exactly what happened. Right? At the end of the dynasty, 400 years later, the temple was, in fact, raised to the ground and all the cedar was burned to ash. And when the people were carried off to Babylon, they had to learn the lesson that God wasn't tethered to that temple. They had to learn that he was sovereign in Jerusalem, and he's also sovereign in Babylon. That's the whole point of of God coming to Ezekiel, riding on this, this chariot across the Kibar Canal. It's to say, I am sovereign even here in Babylon. You can't tether me to Jerusalem. They raised the temple to the ground, but you know how much that affected my sovereignty? Not one little bit whatsoever. I'm still the king. That's the point that Solomon is, is making there. It's a good lesson for us, right? I mean, I, I doubt that anybody, you know, has any sense that this building right here is like the house of God in any way, that God is tethered to this place. I would feel sorry for you if you thought this was kind of it. But it's worth saying it's not. And so, that, you know, that's why you're never going to hear me come up into this pulpit and say something like, it's good to be here with you in the house of the Lord. I'm not going to say that because this isn't the house of the Lord. This is a bunch of bricks and stones, and we meet here. And yes, the New Testament says that, you know, God's presence dwells in us, the people, the church. But it's not connected to the building. And frankly, it's, it's, it's not constrained even by this particular church. God's presence is with churches all over the city of Louisville meeting right now, all over the world this weekend. He cannot be constrained. Do you, see, do you see the point? Do you see, do you see how the two points come together? The building of the temple was not dependent on just Solomon and what he could do. It was dependent on God keeping his promises. But the temple, once built, also couldn't constrain God. He is utterly sovereign, and he always keeps his promises, despite our flakiness. Here's point number two. Our sinfulness and God's faithfulness. Very, very similar kind of point, right? And we're looking at sort of verse 31 all the way to the end of the prayer. By the end of verse 30, Solomon's laid the theological foundation for what he's about to do next, which is make some requests of God. You know, this is, this is not unusual. A lot of times when we pray, the way we do it is say true things about who God is, his character, his nature. And then, based on those things that we've said, we ask God to act in certain ways. You know, you know how that, that works in prayer. So he's made it clear that all this is the result of God keeping his promises. He's made it clear that God is not constrained by this building, even if God has chosen to put special attention on this building. 
And so now in 31, he starts making these requests of, of God. If you look down through there, uh, they're all going to be nicely broken up in your, in your Bible into little paragraphs. There are seven of them. And even though there's a pretty wide variety of situations that are addressed here, they all have the theme of Solomon asking God to act on behalf of the people so for, their, for their good when they come to him at this place, the temple, right? So whatever situation you happen to be in, these seven things, if your people come to this place or pray toward this place with this place in, in mind as they pray to you, O Lord, act on their behalf and for their good. Well, I think if you look at these four things, I think they can sort of be grouped together, or described anyway, in, in four categories. There are four things that Solomon says the temple is for. Justice, welcome, help, and forgiveness. Justice, welcome, help, and forgiveness. So let's, let's look at it. First of all, Solomon says here in praise that the temple is a place of justice. So that's the point of that first petition there in 31 to 32. Each one of these is like two verses until you get to the very last one. If a man sins against his neighbor and is made to take an oath and comes and swears his oath before your altar in this house, then hear, O God, in heaven, and act and judge your servants, condemning the guilty and vindicating the righteous. He's saying this, this temple is a place of justice. This is a place where it's all set right. When human beings get crossways with one another, when human beings uh, wind up at each other's throats about some situation, and nobody is wise enough to figure it out, the place where justice is going to be handed down, the temple. That's the first thing he says. And why? Well, because it's the throne of the God of the universe, the judge of all the earth, the one who will always do right. And so it's a correct expectation that justice will be done in that place. Second, look at the, look at the uh, jump down to 41 to 43, verse 41 to 43. The temple also is to be a place of welcome, 41 to 43. You see, that, that's about the, the foreigners. Likewise, when a foreigner who's not of your people Israel comes from a far country for your name's sake, hear in heaven your dwelling place and do according to, to him everything that he, that he asks you to do. You see the point of that? Solomon very much knows that the temple is not just this provincial little building that is for the benefit of one nation. He expects and understands that the temple will be a place where people from all over the world, all the families of the nations, will hear about the work and character of God and then come to worship him. I mean, again, this, this, is, just, this is just Solomon like reading the Old Testament and then applying it, right? Right? I mean, there, there, there are places in the Pentateuch, scriptures that Solomon himself would have had, where God promises that he's going to bring all the nations to worship him. This is the promise to Abraham, right? In you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And then after Solomon, prophets are going to pick this up later, too. Isaiah 56, when the Lord promises that all the nations of the earth are going to stream to Jerusalem, to the temple, to worship God, and he'll welcome them with open arms. The temple is a place of universal welcome. Third, look at 44 and 45. The temple's a place of help. 44 and 45 is talking about the armies of Israel. When God sends those armies out against their enemies, they'll, they'll find help and provision from the Lord as they pray toward the temple, as they think about the God of Israel. It's a place of help. Fourth, above all, the temple is a place of forgiveness. And the point of fully four of the seven petitions is that the temple is a place of forgiveness. So if you look at 33 and 34, and then 35 and 36, and then 37 to 40, so those three, you'll see that every single one of those is talking about various curses that God promised would fall on his people if they disobeyed him. You can see all of those in the end of, of the book of Deuteronomy. And then you look at 46 to 53, the, the longest one of these. That's a, that's a really long paragraph there. It's even talking about exile. It's the last and most awful of the curses in Deuteronomy. But notice what the point is. Lord, when all these curses fall, when the people sin, hear their prayers of repentance and forgive. I mean, I mean, notice here, too, that Solomon just assumes that the people of Israel are going to sin. You see that? It, it's never if they sin, if this happens. It's always when, when they sin, when it happens. And in, in the last one, verse 46, he even says, he's got this little aside, for there is no one who does not sin. Same idea in 1 John. 
If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Solomon's working with an important kind of realism here that we as Christians need to have as well. You are not going to be without sin until you stand with Jesus. And if your sense of well-being is based on getting to a point where you're not sinning anymore, then your trust is in the wrong place. The Lord does not want your trust as a Christian to be in your ability to not sin. He wants your trust to be in the Savior who forgives sin. So don't let your, the weight of your trust in, in the Lord shift from him to yourself. It's a subtle thing when it happens. It is dangerous. Is that, is that permission to sin? No, no, certainly not. But it is just a reminder to us. It's a reminder from Solomon to the people of Israel that our trust is not to be in ourselves, but in Christ. You're going to sin. You're fallen. You're a rebel against God. But if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, if you've trusted in him for salvation, you have a strong and perfect plea before the Father. And that's where your trust belongs. I want you to notice, too, that in every one of those petitions, the ask that Solomon makes is, Lord, forgive them. And as Solomon makes that petition over and over and over again, you just get the sense that, yes, God is ready. He is wonderfully ready to forgive his people. Because that, that is so far from having changed today. God is not changed in his readiness to forgive. If anything, he's, he's infinitely more ready to forgive because the blood of Christ has been spilled. He stands with open arms before you to accept you and to forgive you and welcome you if you'll come to him. Justice, welcome, help, forgiveness, all of that in the temple. That's where you get it. But there's a problem because there's no more temple, right? So is there no way to get justice, welcome, help, forgiveness? Well, of course there is. And you know the answer. You can see that coming a mile away. Jesus walks into the temple, and he looks at it, and he says, one day, every, it gets rebuilt bigger than Solomon's. He looks around, and he sees it, and he says, every stone of this is going to be thrown down, one off of the other. There's not going to be one stone left upon the other. And he gets challenged, and he says, what are, you, what are you talking about? And then he says, tear this temple down, and in three days, I will raise it up again. And they're all flustered, like, oh, what? it's taking us 40 years to build this temple. How are you going to tear it down and raise it up again in three days? How's that going to happen? Of course, his disciples realized later on he wasn't talking about the building. He's talking about his body. Tear this body down, crucify it, and drop it in a grave. And three days later, I will raise it up. You see what he's doing? He is replacing the building with himself. Which means that if you want justice and welcome and help and forgiveness, you get it not at the old temple, the building, but at the new temple, the person, Jesus. You need justice? Does your heart cry out for justice for some reason? Do you know where you're going to find that? In Jesus. Because he's the one who's going to judge the world. He's the one who's going to set it all right. And so when you pray for justice, it is to Jesus that you pray. Do you just need welcome? Do you just, do you just need to be welcomed somewhere and embraced? Where do you find that? In Jesus. There's a wide open invitation. You and I, every single one of us, are rebels against the Father. Rebels against God. But we find welcome at the temple, not the building, but the person. If you need help, all, all the help you could ever need, you'll find in Jesus. I mean, you, you guys who are members of the church have seen the emails from one of our dear sisters who's been dealing with all kinds of stuff, sickness in herself, sickness in the family, surgery, and shots, and all, all the rest of it. And she, she tells these emails, and they just sound awful, except that in every one of them she says something like, and yet in the midst of it all, Jesus has been by me the whole way. He's never let me down. I'm not going to tell you her name because she'd be embarrassed if I did so. But you know who she is. She knows what it is to find help at the temple. Not the building. The person. And best of all, forgiveness. At Jesus, the new temple, all our sins are forgiven. One last sacrifice made so that we could be saved and justified before Jesus. One last thing. I want you to turn and look at verse 59. And then we'll close. Look what Solomon says here. Let these words of mine, with which I have pleaded before the Lord, be near to the Lord our God day and night, 
And may he maintain the cause of his servant and the cause of his people Israel as each day requires. It's an interesting verse because basically what Solomon is doing here is asking the Lord to take his prayer and put it on file. That's, that's what he's asking to do. Let these words of my prayer be like written down on a scroll and placed before the Lord day and night so that you'll remember them and you'll respond to them. Do, do you know that you don't, you, you don't need to have a prayer like that on file anymore before the Lord? Why not? Because you have a great high priest who is there every single day praying for you as his people. What a wonderful Savior we've got. Let's pray. Our Lord Jesus, we thank you and praise you for all of the good that you have given to us. We thank you that we don't go to a building now to find justice, to find forgiveness, to find help and welcome, but we come to you. You are the place. You are the one where God and human beings meet, and we praise you and honor you as our Savior and Redeemer this morning. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.